Okay, well, welcome everyone here this morning. We're thankful that you found this place, beautiful campground here in northern Indiana. My name is Kevin Manette. Um, I'm here with my, my wife and five of our eight children. Uh, this conference is put on by Syracuse Baptist Church, so collectively we welcome any guests who are here this morning. A hearty welcome to you to this year's Jesus and Politics Conference. Uh, the theme of this uh, conference is Hail to Jesus. Um, now, our mission here today, as always, is to lift up the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I want to begin in prayer because we want every knee to bow to the one who created all things, the one by whose decree thrones and dominions and rulers and authorities exist, all things having been created through him and for him, as Colossians 1.16 says. So let's open in prayer and we'll get started here today. Gracious God, our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this assemblage of your people desiring to hear your word, to be instructed and to practically apply the truths of your word into our spheres of influence, beginning with our own lives, with our families, our churches, and then into our communities and world. Lord, we long for the day when every knee bows and every tongue confesses the Lordship of Christ. We also acknowledge, Lord, that we are often prone to wandering and disobedience in our own lives. And we pray that, first of all, we would get this straight uh, with you, that we would bow our knees before Christ, that our lives would orient around the authority of Christ, and that we would come under his obedience in all areas of life. Now, Lord, bless your, your word and those who present it today. I pray that it would be um, helpful and material that we can apply practically. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, in case you just walked in, I'm, I'm Kevin Manette. I, I have the joy of serving alongside Pastor Tim here as one of the pastors at Syracuse Baptist. This is my third Jesus and Politics conference so far. And uh, the question I have is, have we seen some ground gained in, in these three years? Well, I, I trust that we can point to areas of advancement, maybe in our own personal lives or understanding, maybe in our families, maybe in some aspects of our community. But I think we also feel the pressure of darkness that uh, surrounds us. And uh, certainly we have seen some ground gained in certain quarters and corners. But I think many of us can also point to some battles that have been won in our families, in our churches, in our lives through this last year. And if we don't have a vision, though, that is bigger than, than ourselves and our church, and a vision that influences the kingdom of God, um, that's bigger than, that's influencing even the public sphere in which we exist, then I think we're shirking our duties as Christians to call all people to the obedience of Christ. Genesis 49, verse 10 says, The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he to whom it belongs shall come, and the obedience of the nations shall be his. But, you know, obedience, as always, has to begin with us, with the people of God, with those who profess to love God. The kingdom of God is much bigger than just us, than our individuality and our individual piety, but it certainly doesn't happen without those things being true as well. If the church is weak and sinful, we will not see Satan and his minions being put under our feet, Romans 16, 20. And if literally not a single additional person was converted to Christ, you know, in this year, but imagine not a single convert being added, yet believers actually just living what the Bible says, what kind of impact would that have on this nation? 
Well, the accusation that was lobbed against the early church in Acts 17 was this. When they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. That's the kind of impact that we can see when obedience to Christ is enacted within our lives and in our families and in our churches. But if we look at the church broadly speaking today, the evangelical church, what do we see but a lot of impotence? Because so many who profess Christ aren't even obeying Christ themselves. They're not obeying Christ as Lord. How many women in, in, the, in the church are having abortions? How many in the church are engaged in premarital sex or are in bondage to pornography or any of the other blights that are on our society? You know, the best estimates that we have on some of the figures are staggering. They're sad. And it's no wonder that we are actually seeing very little ground gained in our day and seeing very little reaction from the political realm or from the cultural realm that we as the church are any kind of threat to turn the world upside down. You know, there really ought to be a stark difference between the world and the church. Uh, a study I saw a few years back from Lifeway Research found that seven in ten women who have had an abortion identify as a Christian. Now, you and I right away question that, and so do I. 25% of those claim to be part of evangelical churches. And even if that number is skewed badly because there's many fake churches out there, many fake Christians, the fact is we say we want to be salt and light, but if we really mean it, wow, we have got to get serious about obeying Christ ourselves that we be families that pursue godliness, that we be individuals who pursue godliness, that we be churches that pursue godliness. If we look, if we took the word of God seriously and obeyed Jesus as king, it would have a radical impact on our nation. But it has to begin with us. You know, if, if we started living Christ-like lives, it would Rad and I'm, I'm not just talking about us, but the church, all who profess to love Christ, if we would actually obey him, the, the non-believers would be looking on and saying, wow, how come they're so radically different in so many areas? Their families aren't breaking apart. Their children aren't growing up addicts. They're not addicted to Ritalin. They're not gender confused. Why are their children not growing up um, under these bondages? Well, a big part of the reason we're not seeing revival in the land, I believe, is because the church is not holy. And so I pray that today, through the, the messages and the, the time spent together, and uh, you're going to be hear some convicting truths dished out that you can go home with and apply in the real world whatever that context is for you. Our family is preparing to, to launch out from this place to, to place a stake in the ground in, for the kingdom advancement of Christ in Colorado, in a region where there's literally no other church within, within a, a, about a 40-mile radius. So you can pray for us as we, we go there. Well, before we delve into our distinguished lineup of speakers today... I want to take a moment just to set the stage. The theme of this conference is Hail to Jesus, and that's drawn from um, a, a hymn that our own Brianna Smith wrote based on Psalm 110, and then Tim put, the, put those words to, to music. It's one of those tunes that once you get it in your mind, it's really hard to forget, even if you eventually want to, right? You're like, okay, let's move on to another song. Um, but you just find yourself sing, humming, you know, hail to Jesus, Christ is reigning, you know, all blah, blah, and then, and you're like, oh yeah, I, I guess I could find another song. Uh, but Psalm 110 is a very anchoring text for believers. 
It certainly has been down through the ages of Christianity. It's a psalm that reminds us that Christ reigns both as Savior and King of Kings. And in this psalm, we find the perfect backdrop for our discussions today uh, as we explore how the divine authority of Christ intersects with the realm of the world we live in and the authority that he has over it. Psalm 110 begins with this proclamation, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And in those words, we find the eternal sovereignty of Christ and the ultimate triumph over all who oppose him. It's really a very powerful reminder of the central role that Jesus plays in our faith, as well as his governance and authority over all things. So our, our speakers today are, are going to bring to us uh, helpful information from kind of different aspects of this that will, I believe, enlighten us, inspire our minds, and truths that we can take to heart. Um, we're going we're gonna to be singing for a moment, but I'm going to invite Tim to come up here. Um, his, his message is going to follow the, 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 the song that we're going to be singing. It's, in your, it's on your page there. His so topic is Those Who Forgot History. And if you know Tim, he's known for his eclectic mind. Um, whatever the situation, it will remind Tim of another curious moment in his past or from the life of Bart Simpson, Daffy Duck, or an important lesson his grandpa once taught him. Uh, remembering, remembering is an all too forgotten skill, isn't it? And that's what Tim is planning to talk about with us today. And so in his message, um, I'm not gonna tell you what it's all about, but he's gonna remind us, I believe, of the importance of not forgetting our roots, our history, especially when it comes to the interplay between faith, history, government, and so forth. So uh, let's sing together and then fasten your seat belts because Tim's about to remind us that in the grand story, it's God's story and it, it pays to remember what God's been up to. <laughs> 